Um, I want to introduce to you Kayla Brown, who's from the University of Washington, the DEWIT program. Kayla is a, um, is a frequent contributor to um, issues related to disabilities here on campus. She comes to my class and, and, and gives a talk in, in other locations and other colleges. So, Kayla, thank you again for coming today to talk about this very interesting and very important topic. Disability in the media. Thank you. Hi. Um, sorry, we got a little late start. <laughs> um, I, like Al said, my name is Kayla, and I work at the University of Washington with some students with disabilities. A lot of them in high school, and I do some activist work. And in particular, I'm really passionate about the media uh, because I think media, for me, are faced with all of these horrible things in the world, uh, we can all connect to the media. It's one thing that we all can relate to, and I think we need to understand and harness the power that it has. And we can actually make a lot of change when we think about media in a critical way. And so what I want to do today is um, talk about how disability is portrayed in all forms of media. I am going to be focusing a lot on movies and uh, television and some comic book um, references. You don't have to know comics, but I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, so I, I um, you know, I'm going to cover a few things that, that I know personally, and I'd love your input as I go forward uh, about your experiences with media, because Although I am a Netflix addict, I don't know it all. Um, and so, so that's kind of how I would love to start uh, briefly. Does anyone want to share what your favorite form of media is? Something you really enjoy and why? Uh, and I think this will kind of introduce us to, okay, well, what's media? Media can be a lot of things. Um, as I have lived listed here, books, movies, graphic novels, television shows, web series, fan fiction even, poetry, magazines, radio, uh, audio books, and art, uh, and there are more. Um, but does anyone have a form of media that they spend a lot of time with and why? Anyone want to share? Comments? Oh, I saw your hand first. Oh. I listen to a lot of radio and podcasts. Yeah. Partially because it's like more personal. I think uh, for me, graphic novels, like, uh, the reason I like it because uh, sometimes, like, you want to hear some of the things which are not, like, directly quoted, like, which are, like, figuratively talking about some of the issues. Maybe that's a, cannot express it in some way, like, trying to. Expresses figuratively. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Something that comes to mind is X Men when you're talking about maybe it's not explicitly <coughs> a metaphor for disability, but it was actually created, uh, you know, the writers and creators had in mind um, a metaphor for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. and so, so, yeah, absolutely. It might not be explicit, but a lot of graphic novels um, cover a lot of disability issues which I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, and so I have to start, uh, before I get into like the heavy stuff, now you know what's headed for us. Um, <laughs> when we talk about media, we have to talk about the past and the historical context, how we got here, why, and so we're gonna start with talking about some of that history. And I promise I will connect it with so I talk a lot, a lot about institutions when it relates to people with disabilities. And institutions have a deep history. A lot of what I talk about when I do presentations is when it emerged um, in the early 1900s. Uh, that's when there were a lot of um, returning veterans coming through, which really sparked this uh, national issue that was raised about, well, what do we do with people with disabilities? Um, and as I'll talk about in one of my next slides, is that 
we've always tried to uh, normalize our society through eugenics, but this was kind of a different uh, integration into institutions. But essentially, a lot of people didn't know what to do with people with disabilities. Even you could be coded, a lot of women um, were called crazy. Um, that's kind of a, um, a gender term we still use today. Uh, and so you could be put in an institution for any, any reason, really. Um, you know, some of them eventually turned into job training facilities, but for the most part, what we're looking at is uh, an abandonment of people um, who are put into institutions in really unhealthy conditions um, and just, you know, awful, awful stuff going on. Um, medical experiments, doctors actually believed that people with disabilities were lesser humans and so they could do a lot of um, experiments on them. So science kind of emerged from this idea of, um, of essentially experimenting on a lot of different minorities, whether it was ra racial, uh, disability, uh, women were, you know, so, so there's a, a deep, deep rooted um, you know, medical uh, legacy for people with disabilities. And so we emerged um, with that, uh, some stereotypes, beggars, things like that. Um, one of those images, it's a blind uh, and deaf uh, person and the, holding a sign that says, pity the poor girl that is deaf and blind and dumb and she's begging. So back to kind of the scientific and medicalized perspective, uh, and also kind of combining with a lot of you have probably talked about what language is appropriate to use in certain situations, and so I've given sort of disability etiquette talks where we say, well, it's not good to say crazy, it's not really good to say dumb or idiot, they're hard habits to break. But this is an excerpt from a, and I know it's kind of hard to see, but I'll, I'll read um, some of the things that it says. This is from a medical um, article, uh, a paper, that was talking about a, um, a study they did on people that they referred to as, um, you know, lower beings, idiots, um, uh, kind of the bottom, uh, level of society, and so they put people into categories. Um, so at the bottom, there's kind of that stair type um, metaphor, where at the bottom we have uh, the term idiot, and these are all medical terms. So we've got idiot, which were described as mentally, about a three-year-old, uh, and then as we go up, the age correlation also goes up, but low-grade imbecile, medium imbecile, high-grade imbecile, uh, and some, when you were categorized, were put into kind of class groups. Uh, and then at the top we see there's a moron, which they say um, work requiring reason and judgment was okay for that person. Um, and so, so disability became a class category. Um, and so I think that's important to just talk about um, and this is why. So there was a movie, and this movie is called The Black Stork. Um, it was in the silent movie era, so it's very, very old. But essentially, this movie was written, acted by, created by um, a doctor who believed that we should um, essentially eliminate or kill infants who have disabilities. And so this was one of the most infamous uh, movies of the silent era. And so it made a case to society that infants should die if they are disabled. And so it sparked a debate between 1917 on through um, the late 1920s. Um, and really, this movie became a symbol of America's 
struggle with the idea of eugenics. So, so what the story is about, I'll just say briefly, is um, it, it's a surgeon uh, who is played by the actual um, doctor who wrote and promoted eugenics. Um, it starts with him consulting with parents, essentially trying to convince them to let their child die because that child would not have a good life and um, although the child probably would have lived on, uh, he recommended just leaving it alone and letting it pass naturally. Um, and so, so this is an example of the severity that the media can have in historical life. Um, you know, this is a promotion of a doctor's cause through a feature length motion picture. And so we have this concept of a cinematic argument. This is an extreme example, but nonetheless, this has had a major impact on what we know and what we see today in society because we're still addressing issues of eugenics today. Um, we're still, as a disability community trying to prove to people that we deserve to live. And I can tell you that you can see them in small interactions, such as somebody asking me would I ever want to reproduce and pass my disability and on genetically. Well, why are we asking that question? Why would we want to know that? And why would I answer that question? That might be a personal question, <laughs> um, but what's code in the there? So that's just an example of kind of a smaller interaction I could have with somebody. Um, there's also, I mean, people with disabilities over history were forcefully sterilized for very similar reasons. And so there's a quote from a book, it's called Not Dead Yet. Um, Americans with disabilities don't want your pity or your legal mercy. We want freedom, <coughs> and we want life. So, uh, there's a picture of a cat for you. Um, <laughs> as we conclude that portion, which is a little bit heavier than the rest, uh, any reactions so far? Questions? Opinions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. I just want to add something. From a historical perspective, going back to early Christian days, in that paradigm, you know, we had the model of uh, the chair, the pity model for people with disabilities. And so non-disabled individuals would receive grace from the church for giving alms to the poor. And so those with disabilities had an important role to play for the non-disabled. And that's an interesting way to look at that perspective. as a tool in yes. society and it's, it's very real and yeah it, especially when you look at it from a religious sense I mean, that could be a whole session in itself um, but yes so uh, any other thoughts before? yeah um, with the institution ones you said it started in the 1920s um, 1920s uh, was that still going on in the 90s? yes it happens now yeah We're, we are fighting um we, last legislative session, we got some uh, compromises. We're trying to shut down the five, I believe, five institutions we have in Washington. Um, now, of course, you know, we don't have the same conditions, maybe, in the ones in Washington, um, but we have isolation from society happening. We have um, low funding. They, they really, there, there are a lot of really bad institutions, and I can't speak for all of them, but they still exist. So. Do you know what the age range is? Like, oh, they like can be, be kids to adults, yes. I, I only asked them that when I was five, doctors told my mom that uh, by the time I was 10, I'd end up in a mental, in a mental, mental institution for the rest of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it, I interacted with a lot of parents, in particular during the legislative season that session, but they wanted, they needed institutions because they weren't being provided respite. They weren't being provided help from the state to be able to have a functional life themselves because some of their children need proper clock care. So their only uh, option was to send them to a rural town, because a lot of them are in eastern Washington, away from their families, and um, what we want is community integration for us. So, so yeah, that's um, that's still something today. And, they're, and that's just in Washington. So, um, so like for attending, mean, do people see the concepts of killing children with disabilities? Sorry? So for attending here today, so do people see the concept of the children with disabilities? Well, you can kind of see that. We could talk about um, the fact that we do prenatal testing mm -hmm. and the kind of, um, <coughs> it, it's a very complicated subject, um, balancing you know, me personally being pro-choice with, okay, well, what does targeted abortion mean? People are specifically t uh, thinking a lot about uh, people uh, having children with Down syndrome. Uh, uh, people with Down syndrome, and, you know, parents often can have the opportunity to choose if they want to have an abortion because they don't think that they can take care of the child with Down syndrome. So that's, that's something that's happening today. So Designer are, genes also. Designer genes, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, very um, scary time we live in when we can potentially eliminate certain characteristics that we don't like. Well, where's the line with that? What, what bodies do we value in society? I bet we can probably brainstorm and figure out what kind <laughs> of, um, you know, and, and they're even talking about making people smarter, um, mm -hmm. fighting smart genes, which, anyway, it's, it's a scary time. Uh, not to say that there aren't, you know, I, I think we can all agree that we should cure cancer. That would be a good one to cure. Um, <laughs> but, so it, this is something that I think we should all also think about as well. Oh, uh, I'll go here and here. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I was going to say, I don't know, how we launch this hugely, but um, what um, charities or organizations would you say would be something for people that don't, that want to contribute in some way, like on a financial level, like are pretty sound? I mean, like, I'm honestly ignorant about the subject in regards to charities, so, like, of course, Barge and I is the first thing that comes to mind, but. I don't. I know that charities are kind of a tricky thing because yeah. not all the money actually goes to what it's, yeah. um, you know, instilled for. So, mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, from all the stuff that you researched and know, like, what directly is impactful and helpful? Yeah. To I, to? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And one of the bigger ones that I, we could talk about is organizations like Autism Speaks, which um, has a very deep-rooted history of wanting to eliminate autism. Um, I wasn't going to show it today, and, and I know people have time, but there's, uh, they put out a very terrifying, literally terrifying um, commercial that was basically directed by Alfonso Cuaron, which, you know, he is a Harry Potter fan, he directed one of the movies, so I was like, oh god! Um, he directed this commercial that basically was directed as if um, autism was the uh, villain in a horror movie. They, some of the words they said were, um, autism will destroy your family, you'll never, you, you know, you can, you'll get divorced, you'll be embarrassed of your child, so it's like very intense. Um, and, but autism speaks, yes, they aren't changing, I think, they just announced I haven't read it. Some different direction they want to go in, but they've traditionally been very you know, curative focused, um, which is not really what the autism community wants. Mm -hmm. Because I know the people in that spectrum, they're, they have created a community that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some pride, um, and you know, they kind of want to live now, and get support now, maybe get some social services. And, uh, and, 
and uh, the Moscow History Association, um, Jerry's Kids. Just Google Jerry's Kids and, I don't know, ableism. But <laughs> you'll find a lot of stuff uh, explaining why that's wrong. But, uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Always do research. I have to as well. So stepping on the fact that I used Mark Bynes as an example, would you say historically it was obviously changed to work more of the first ones? I mean, do you think they're not a very sound? No, I'm not sure. I'm not much um, but I'd be curious to know. Because um, I, yeah, I still have that dilemma of like, oh God. <laughs> what, <laughs> what is this charity projecting out, but what's the truth? So mm -hmm. yeah. I struggle a little bit with that goodwill as well. Yeah, which is because I've heard disparaging things about March Times as I have about the you know, like the material thing. So you don't know what chatter to cling on to when it like, comes really effective and where's the camera. It's very <laughs> depressing. Yeah. I also think back to the slide that you had down earlier about that uh, with the hand that says, like, um, nothing for me without me. And so oh. I. I am always critical of like who's, who has a seat at the table in terms of decision making at those organizations and what is the real goal? Is the goal to quote unquote cure this, um, what's deemed a disability or is the goal like liberation of, um, of all of us in terms of the ways that we think about um, people's ability status? So. Exactly, finding disability one charities or any you know, not even like, I don't even want to use the word charity also. I would say um, there are probably what you could do is look for some um, activist groups, some uh, community groups that are run by people with disabilities. Okay. So, yeah, um, the kind of main point as we move forward is. Well, television and movies and media influence the way that people think. Um, if portrayals exhibit negative stereotypes, this will affect how we see groups of people as a whole. So I want to define ableism for those of you who may not um, know um, or have heard of that term. So ableism can be a lot of things. I just have a few examples up here. Um, victim blaming, for example, with mental health, uh, saying, oh, it's all in your head. <laughs> Maybe that's true. Uh, it's all in your head. You can uh, eat some chocolate, you'll feel better. Go for a run, you'll feel better. Um, so, blaming somebody, um, you know, the, this billboard says, imagine if you got blamed for having cancer. So, we need to think about mental health in, in the same kind of ways that we regard uh, other disabilities. Uh, lack of accessibility, pity, which we'll talk more about, educational barriers, and we'll talk more about objective uh, Job inequity, more people with disabilities are uh, unemployed and in poverty. And then, um, so there's just two paradigms of, of thinking about disability. One is this medical model, which we talked about, which essentially is looking at people with disabilities with uh, the viewpoint that they need to be fixed, that their bodies are the problem, and that they need to, um, yeah, they need to be fixed, and that's the number one goal, which is why we feel so comfortable with charities that kind of promote those curative paradigms. And then we, on the flip side, we have the social model, which is the Hey, it's society that's not working for me. I can't get up a flight of stairs, not because of my body, because you put the stairs there. Um, I can't, or somebody who's visually impaired, I can't, um, you know, read a book because it's not in the braille. That's, that's society not fitting to me. It's, it's fitting what works for what we think is most So some statistics, um, there are an estimated 56 million Americans living with disabilities, that's one in five, and I'm sure that it's higher than that. Um, in a 2011 study, Vlad put out uh, a report called Where We Are on TV, 2011, 
and this is a report on diversity in television. Um, they said 1% of characters with disabilities were portrayed on TV. Very few of these characters were played by people with disabilities. Um, a report said it was only literally two, uh, two actors, but I know for a fact that's not true, but I think it's definitely less than 20. <laughs> So what is representation? What, what do we think that is? Uh, I think that media representation is the ways in which the media portrays particular groups, communities, and experiences. And this includes accuracy of portrayals, uh, the diversity of perspectives, and whether those portrayals perpetuate, perpetuate negative stereotypes. It's not just about quantity, this is about quality. So in addition, looking at this in a kind of an intersectional perspective, well, most of the characters we see who do have disabilities are white males. Um, so in addition to the lack of racial and gender diversity, um, many uh, characters are fueled by stereotypes of overcoming. They're overcoming their disability. And in, in this kind of trope, we have the goal to inspire the other characters through that overcoming of the disability. And there's nothing wrong with a character being an inspiration to others, but it should not be the only purpose that that character serves. And so I do a little test when I'm trying to figure out if uh, I can at least begin to appreciate a character. Uh, let's strip away their disability. What do they have? What's left? Do they have hobbies? Do they have friends? Do they leave the house? Um, it's kind of like the Bechdel test, in a way. Uh, do, do people know what the Bechdel test is? So the Bechdel test essentially is, uh, when we look at female characters, are there more than two characters who are women that talk to each other about something other than them? very little. Very, very little. Uh, you would be surprised. How many movies do you pass the back of this? Um, if, a woman, if a woman talks to another woman, it's usually about that. Um, and then in other cases, we've got women characters that don't even talk to each other. So yeah, keep an eye on that. You'll be surprised. <laughs>
don't necessarily want to be cured, but we do want to be the stars of our own stories. We want to be the heroes, the villains, the ones with complex relationships. We want to be more than our disabilities. We want everyone else to see and love our disabilities, the way many of us have come to love our disabilities. Um, so that is a picture of the character that I was most heart heartbroken with. Um, being a comic book fan, uh, that girl was shot and paralyzed by the Joker, Amy Ron, um, and she became uh, so paralyzed in a wheelchair. And she became, she took on a new superhero name called Oracle. And she used technology as an empowering tool to help other people. So she would be a hacker, she would help Batman and, and all these, um, and Black Widow and all these other characters solve crime and do things. She wasn't just depressed, although it did address her coming to terms with her disability. Um, she actually interacted with another person who was in the wheelchair to try to, to learn about it and connect with something. And then, uh, as sometimes happens in comic books, you get a new writer and you scrap it. And so um, she became that girl now. And um, they just kind of threw Oracle away, even though she was a fantastic character. So I kind of cried a little bit. Um, then we have this idea that characters have some magic about them, superpowers. And you see this in science fiction all the time. Um, there's a picture of Professor X up there, because that's the character that people think of most often when I say, hey, tell me a character with a disability. Uh, a lot of people say that. Um, and then we have, uh, and I'll talk about this more on the next slide, there's a, a show called Parenthood, which I have not watched much of. But I did so that I could get to know the character, the son, who has autism. And it talks about it in a family context, you know, the family being really angry that their son was diagnosed, and there, there's that aspect. But he has all these
the, the bottom line, the theme is that if you have a disability as severe as his was, quadriplegia, then really your life's not worth living. Like a million dollar baby, same idea, that uh, you have no value in society, and so they kill them off, they commit suicide. So their, their hashtag for this film is live boldly. <laughs> live boldly. This is about a love story. And he falls in love with his caregiver. And she's the quirky girl trope, by the way. Um, <laughs> I just want to add one more thing. I think the reason why they kill him off in the end, the author kills him off in the end, is that it leaves us, the non-disabled individual, of the burden of having to worry about the disabled person. That's one of us burden. So psychologically, it releases us some guilt or whatever we have associated around that topic. Exactly. It's very common. Yeah. It's to relieve us. to look at other people 
we're saying when we say that person is inspirational when you don't know anything about them other than you have this I know that I have many people who said that like I inspire them, um, and they've all told me why. And uh, it's not because they're like, like, it's the fact that I have all these barriers, and yet still every day I get everything I have to do done despite all the challenges that I face. And that it's not because I have a harder life than them. It, I was told that when we went into the foster over at Ada, said that it shows them that they can get it done too, even though they have it. So, so it's often done with really good intentions, and there's nothing wrong with being inspirational. Um, but for example, if I'm at the bus stop and somebody comes up to me and says, um, gosh, you're so inspirational. I see you on the bus every day, and I just, it just inspires me. And I just said, why? And I see your student ID. ID, you're in school, right? So yeah. So is everyone else at this bus stop? We're on campus at UW. Um, and you know, I just keep digging further and further to what they are talking about. And then when we get to the bottom of it, it's because it's only because I have a disability that I'm perfectly happy with them. I'm perfectly happy with my disability. My family knows my struggle. They have a right. And sometimes I flatter because there are difficult things. But I can tell you the difficult things are able bodied people, non disabled people, their attitudes, the way society has been built by non disabled people. So that is my opinion. Uh, I watched a documentary that's uh, in HBO, like it's called Life According to Sam, and a, oh, yeah. you, know, you, you must have watched it. And that's a very inspiring story of a disabled person. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have been working with uh, Stephen Hawking, because he, he's overcome, he's had barriers for the time, and he's made and he, he's become a very um, successful person. All the barriers he had from the uh, uh, what do they call it, game, uh, he diagnosed when he was 21, and then he uh, was a the road guy, and I was not uh, in the road guy. I don't know, I don't know if it does. I dare say I, It's not wrong. Um, I think it's contextual. And I think that the problem is, oh, and I'll show you one. I will show you one. Um, we have some internet memes here. And we have one that is um, an athlete. I don't know his name. Oh, his story. Non-disabled people mostly, 
the time, and they're bitter because what we think is that, well, you can't be happy with this. You can't get in a car crash and become paralyzed and happy. Um, if that's written by the perspective of the person who's disabled, that's fine, because that's a reality. But a lot of us are perfectly fine. And that's a novel concept. Um, so I wanted to show you just some examples of, of where where are the people with disabilities? Um, has anyone watched the show Switched at Birth? Oh, yeah, yeah, because you should. It's a guilty pleasure for sure. Oh, it's so good. Um, it's about, you know, the premise is silly. It's about two girls switched at birth, one of whom is deaf. And so there are a lot of deaf characters played by people who are deaf. Uh, it's a really cool show. You should check it out. Glee, most, most people know Glee, or I think, I don't know. I don't know what people watch anymore. Uh, I made a Legally Blonde reference yesterday, and I <laughs> nobody knew it, so I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, so yeah, Artie, a kid in a wheelchair, played by an able body actor. Some more examples. White men. My biggest pet peeve. Hospital wheelchairs. Everywhere. Everywhere. What the hell? <laughs> no. That's what I'll say on that. And more actors with disabilities. <laughs> uh, Marley Madeline, <coughs> deaf actress. Uh, the only deaf, deaf performer to win an Academy Award for Best Lead Actress. She's in Switch of uh, There's a cool web series uh, called Might Give Me Life. Very funny, created by a woman in a wheelchair. Breaking Bad. I haven't watched, but everyone loves it, so actor with a disability. <laughs> Uh, so I'm in an American War Story kick. I just watched uh, Coven. Uh, and so they use actors for every season. We were good in the previous season. And, um, this is Jamie Brewer. She was written in, nothing to do with her disability. She was a huge part of it. She had a whole plot line, imagine that. Um, I don't know. She does terrible things, she does great things, she is written like an actual person. Uh, Peter Dinklage, most of us know from Game of Thrones, but when he was in X-Men, he was just written into it, even though in the comics it was not a short, a person of short stature. Um, they just thought, hey, he's a great actor, let's put him in. Hmm. I love that man. It's an incredibly feminist film, for those of you who do not know. Uh, <coughs> amazing. Of course, Charlize Theron does not have a disability, but she uh, has a really badass prosthetic. And I was going to show this uh, fight scene from the movie where she doesn't have her prosthetic limb, but she totally kicks ass. Um, which is awesome. So I love that. You should watch it. Watch it from a disability perspective, from a feminist perspective. It's really cool. Silver Lining Playbook. I wanted to show a depiction of mental health issues. Um, and I think it captures depression pretty well. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon is really cute. It's actually like, if you haven't seen it, there are, um, you know, the main character loses his leg. Dragon doesn't have a wing. I thought it was the second season with, with the main characters and that. What? I thought it was a Happy Dragon 2 with the main character. Yeah, that is true. So, Dungeons and Dragons.
experiences, but allow them to present authentic, nuanced portrayals that do not only that add not only to the rich, diverse fabric of our country, but create a greater understanding about the society in which we live. Um, and I was going to end on this hilarious compilation of um, <laughs> white at male actors winning Academy Awards um, for portraying people with disabilities. Um, and it's really funny <laughs> because um, there's actually, I think it was John Travolta. No, not John Paul Cruz, I mixed them up, I don't know why. Um, said, you know, all you have to do is play a person with disability and you'll get, you'll get for sure get an award. Something to think about. Um, we need to encourage more people with disabilities and characters with disabilities to be written into our media. If we don't, we're not going to progress. Um, it's, it's really important. I, I believe that. And I believe that we can make change and uh, make a difference. So, yeah.